it is between the flesh of a natural sinful nature and the spirit which is what we received at our new birth. So let's look at what chapter 8, 5 to 10 says. I read from my New King James. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally, and that word is fleshly minded, is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal or the fleshly mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Folks, we have a nature that is incapable of keeping the law, but more than that, we have a nature that is anti-God. And that is what crucified Christ. It was not the Jews. It was sinful flesh that crucified Christ. Verse 8. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not, he is none of his. He is not his. That is, he is unconverted. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now what is Paul saying in these few verses? You will notice that the battleground of these two natures is the mind. The spirit puts God's desires in our mind. The sinful nature puts desires in our mind. The mind has to decide which of the two take over. That's the battle, folks, of our Christian living. When our minds are dominated, now I use the word very strongly, when our minds deliberately choose to live according to the flesh, or by the desires, this makes it possible, folks, for the devil to pull us out of Christ, and the result is eternal death. That's what Paul is saying. Now, there is a thing that I need to be, you to be aware of. Keep your finger here. Turn to 1 Corinthians and chapter 3. I want you to find out something that you need to know. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And notice what Paul says here. And I, brethren, verse 1, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, fleshly, as to babes in Christ. So when you first became a Christian, your flesh controlled you. You were a babe in Christ. But now look at verse 2. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. Have you ever tried to feed a three-month-old baby with Loma Linda linkets? <laughs> you know, when we first went to the mission field way back in 65, Loma Linda produced, maybe it was Worthington, I don't know, this uh, slice, you know, imitation chicken. <laughs> but it was so rubbery, they've improved it since then, that our kids used it as chewing gum. <laughs> they chew, they could not swallow it. Finally they spit it out when all the taste was gone. So Paul is saying, I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it, and even now, you are still not able. This letter, folks, was written 10 years after their conversion. Now, how would you mothers like to change diapers of your babies 10 years after they are born? But you know, we have a lot of babies in our churches. Many of them come to me, why are you giving us this heavy stuff? And you've been a Christian for 20, 30 years, still on milk? Come on, folks. It's time we grew up. For you are st verse 3, for you are still carnal, fleshly. For, now what's the evidence? For where there is envy, strife, and division among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men, like the people of the world? What Paul is saying, there's very little distinction between you guys and the worldly people. Now, I have had some people tell me, including some pastors, that this is Paul writing about unconverted members of the Corinthian church. Well, I have news for you. That's why I gave you verse 16. To the same people, he writes, 
verse 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you? You know, you must make a distinction between the Holy Spirit dwelling in you and the Holy Spirit controlling you. World of difference. Because the Holy Spirit will never force you to do what it wants you to do. There has to be a complete surrender to the cross of Christ so that he can take over. Uh, let's go on. Let me explain something more. Hence the need to walk in the Spirit. Let me put it this way. All our lives, folks, we've been walking in the flesh. That's, we were born that way. That's how we were walking. Now we have to learn to walk in the Spirit, which is complete opposition to walking in the flesh. And that's a struggle. You know, when babies are born, at least the majority of them are born with legs. When they learn to walk, do they fall? Do they fall? Yes. How many times? Have you counted? And after 70 times 7, you say, next time you fall, you're out of the house. So if we humans can understand the struggles with our kids growing up, God is most sympathetic with the struggling with the flesh. In fact, Hebrews 4.15 says that Christ is able to sympathize with our struggle because he knew what he, he went through himself. He was tempted in all points, as we are. So please remember that we need to learn to walk in this way. It's a discipline. And I'll be frank with you. It was much easier for Jean and I to walk in the spirit in Uganda under Idi Amin, where he tried to kill us, and under Ethiopia, in commun under communism in Ethiopia, when I wrote a book against communism and they wanted to kill me. It was much easier to keep totally dependent on the Holy Spirit than to walk in the flesh. But when you come to the land of milk and money, that's the African definition of America, folks, the temptation is far greater. It's very, it takes more discipline to walk in the Spirit. Okay, now, in verse 9 and 10, this is of Romans 8, listen to what Paul wrote here. Verse 9 and 10. But you, that is you born again Christians, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. He does not mean you don't have the flesh. Yeah, you still have the flesh. I still have the flesh. But you have chosen to walk in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, what on earth is Paul trying to tell us here? Well, before we go to that, let's go to Romans 6, verse 3 and 4. This is something we confessed at our baptism. Now remember, baptism is never into a denomination. It's always into Christ. Listen to verse 3 of Romans 6. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And if you look at verse 10, the death that Christ died was to sin. Therefore, we have chosen to accept our death in Christ to sin. Therefore, verse 4, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious glory of the Father, even so in the same way we also should walk in newness of life. Now, I explained this before. Let me just remind you. The life you and I were born with the New Testament word that uses for that life is bios. That's the Greek word for the human life that we received from Adam after the fall. A life controlled by self. The divine life that you receive at the new birth is zoe. Two different words. But your Bible says life for both, so you can't tell the difference. On the cross, folks, our human life. The bios life died not for three days. The law would not be satisfied. It died forever on the cross. And in exchange, God gave us the life of his son. So that in Romans, okay, 1 Corinthians 5.17, Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone. But all that is by faith, folks. The reality took place in Christ. So as Christians, we have said goodbye to the old life. And now Paul is saying you need to put that into practice. 
Turning to Romans 8, verse 11 to 17, listen to what Paul says. Chapter 8 of Romans, verse 11. Very important statement. The rest is expounding on that. But if the spirit of him, the him is Christ, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who was raised, who has raised Christ from the dead will also give life, that Greek word is zoe, to your dead mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. Now let me explain this. I've done it before when I want to repeat it. What put Christ to death? What killed Christ on the cross? It wasn't the cross because we know from Roman historians it takes between three to seven days to die on a cross. Jesus died within six hours. What killed him? It wasn't the cross. It was the wages of sin. The wrath of God against our sins. That now sin, when it kills, it puts you in the grave forever. The wages of sin is goodbye to life forever. But you know the good news? Our sins could not keep Christ down. The resurrection proved that the power of the Holy Spirit is greater than all the accumulated sins of the world put together. That, folks, is part of the good news of the gospel. And that same spirit that raised up Jesus is dwelling where? In you and in me. That's what Paul is saying in verse 11. Now with that in mind, let's look at verse 12 to 17. Therefore, in view of this fact, brethren, we are debtors, we have an obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. But if you live according to the flesh, if you deliberately choose to live by your sinful nature, the desires of the self, you will die. But by, if you, by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So our goal as Christians is, not I, but who? Christ. We must allow the Holy Spirit to live in us. Now that is the, not as easy as it says, because we have to live completely in contradiction to our own very nature. Okay, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. That is, before your conversion, you were afraid to face the future. But you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, which is in Aramaic, Dear Father. You see, one of the joys of being a Christian, we have been adopted into the family of God. Do you know in the Bible, an adopted child has all the rights of a natural child? So just as Christ is the, is the king of the universe, we are joint heirs with him. And he will bring this out in a moment. But I like verse 16 and 17. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. See, man is made of three parts. Body, soul, and spirit. The spirit is the element that we have that animals don't have by which God dwells and controls us. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. What a privilege. We are joint heirs with Christ. Do you know what a joint account is? I'm glad Jean is not here. She's with her sister. <laughs> That's how she jokes. She says, you earn the money, I spend it. But that's her joke. She also earned money to put our kids to school. So we are joined as with If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And I'll explain that in a moment. But now, turning to Romans 8, 11 to 7, we discover an important truth. The strength, the power of our Christian living is not us. It is the Holy Spirit. He is the one that is able to give us total victory over the flesh. Okay, let's go on. Then in verse 18 to 30, Paul reminds believers that to walk in the Spirit means suffering in the flesh. Before we go to 1 Peter, please notice what verse 18 to 30 says, says in Romans chapter 8. 
For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revelation, revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. What is Paul saying here? But let's go on and then I'll explain it to you in a moment. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. But not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we are, were saved in this hope, that is the redemption of the body, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things, not some, but all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, those he also glorified. Now this is a very difficult passage, so let me go step by step and explain what Paul is trying to get across. What we need to know, folks, is that when Adam sinned, it did not only affect the human race. It affected all of creation. See, when God created this world, he gave Adam and Eve dominion over all the beasts of the field. And this is very important to know, especially if you are a missionary in Africa. You know, I've mentioned this before. When we were in Uganda, the, another mission and I, we traveled visiting all the mission stations because we were very discouraged. The people were discouraged under Idi Amin. And Uganda does not have McDonald's, or it doesn't have Wendy's, it doesn't have Taco Bell you have to take a sack lunch with you. And we were traveling from the hospital Ishaka on the western part of Uganda after encouraging the people there working for Christ to Fort Portal, which is at the foot of the mountains of the moon, about 200 miles of dirt roads. And it was, after, it was just after midday, my, my friend Bob Pfeiffer said to me, Jack, it's past 12 o'clock, I see two trees, this is all savanna grassland. I see two trees in the distance. Can you please park your car under the shade? So I said, sure. So I left this road and went over this grassy land and parked the tree under the, parked the car under that tree. And we looked up and there were two lions having their siesta. You know, an average lion sleeps about 20 hours a day. They're the laziest animals in the world. They're the king of the beast. Those lions would be there till about 6.30. This is midday or just after midday. The one I parked the car under was a female, and the other one that do the killing. <laughs> now the lions in your zoo, because they don't do any killing, their paws are not that thick. But if you look at the African lion, huge front paws, they can break your neck with one slap. In America, the lions are in cages and you are free, but it's the opposite in Africa. They are free and you better be in your cage. So we put our windows up. And as we began eating our sandwiches, the lioness looked at us and growled because we disturbed her sleep. But we were in our cage. Nobody could touch us until it came time to live. And I turned the key and nothing would happen. The car refused to start. And they did not teach us in Andrews University how to deal with such a problem. 
So we tried a human solution. We opened the doors of the car, front doors, put our legs out to push the car away from the lioness because it's huge. there was a button under the hood that if you pressed it would start the car. But there was a big clump of grass under one back wheel and all we could do was a rocket, rocket and rocket till we were exhausted. And Bob said to me, look Jack, God protected the da Daniel in the lion's den. So what are you afraid of? And I said, that's a nice children's story. This is reality. <laughs> and he reminded me that was reality. So we did what we should have done in the beginning. We prayed and asked God to protect me. Now, I don't know if you realize, but human beings are afraid we let out a smell. No amount of sure can hide that smell, folks. Wild animals can smell that fear, even dogs. If a dog attacks you, learn to relax. If you want to, it to stop. I, I'm talking from experience, but this is, this is not a dog. This is a huge lioness, 350 to 400 pounds. So I decided to get rid of my fear to give that lioness a Bible study. And I walked out and she looked at me with big eyes as if to say I would be, make a good lunch for her. I said to her, I know you're bigger than me, I know you're stronger than me, but God has given mankind dominion over all the beasts of the field. <laughs> and that includes you. You better stay where you are. She cocked her head as if to say, who are you kidding? But by this time I had the hood open I knew where the button was, I pressed it and my eyes was on her all the time. And I pressed the button, the car started, and the lioness did what your cat does before pouncing on a bird. It twitched his tail. That's the signal. And I think I broke the Olympic record. I was in that car. <laughs> <laughs> and when she saw me jumping in the car, she went back to her branch. The hood was still up. I drove about 50 yards away and then came out and put the hood down. But when Adam sinned, the dominion of the whole world, not just the human race, was given to Satan. And God said to Adam and Eve, because of that, vegetation will produce thorns. You know, I had to get rid of some of the rose branches because yesterday was what we call collection day for the green garbage. <laughs> and boy, those thorns are pretty painful. Don't blame God for those thorns. That's the result of the fall. That is why when they placed a crown of thorns on the head of Christ at the cross, God was telling the world, my son is bearing the curse of what Adam did. So please remember that when Adam sinned, we lost dominion over the world. Satan became the ruler of this world. He even told Christ in the third, second temptation, the world has been given to me, dominion has been given to me, and I can give it to whoever I like. All you have to do is worship and bow down and worship me. Of course, Christ never did that. So what Paul is saying in Romans 8 is this, that because of our situation, because our nature has not changed, we are waiting anxiously, just like creation, for the redemption of the body. And that is what we are looking forward to. That is our hope, folks. We are redeemed, but our body has not yet been redeemed. You know, when we were in the mission field, <laughs> we had a missionary. He's, he may be well known. He, was, he became then the pastor of PUC, Roger Bothwell. I don't know if you... But we were missionaries together. He had a dog. And one day, his dog killed a chicken of the, near the, in the next village, in the, in the village next to the college. And the lady brought this chicken to Roger Bothwell and she said to him, your dog killed my chicken. You owe me five shillings, which is about a dollar fifty. And he paid a dollar fifty. Guess what? Next week she brought another chicken. And the following week another chicken. And every time he paid five shillings. So he came up to me and said, what do I do? I said, look, when you pay that lady the five shillings for the chicken, that chicken belongs to you. So take the chicken away from her. You may not eat it. Give it to you know, one of our members. You know, they, they eat chickens, you know. And uh, it will stop her doing it. And sure enough, it did. The dog never killed any of his chickens, we discovered. 
here she got a free meal plus money in her pocket. She was wise, you know. So folks, we are groaning. Please notice in verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. For not only that, but we also, who have the first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan. Now please notice where we groan. Within ourselves, not publicly. We groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Folks, in heaven we will not struggle with the flesh. We will have sinful flesh. You know, Sister White made a statement that has confused some of our brethren. This is way back when she was alive. She said, during the time of trouble, we will have to live before a holy God without a mediator. She did not say without a savior, but without a mediator. And so we came up with the idea that we must overcome every sin to be prepared for the time of trouble. Well, I'll tell you folks, even though God gives you victory over every sin, you're still 100% sinner because your nature has not changed. So who are you kidding? So that has been what we've been, some of our people have been teaching others, you must overcome every sin before you face the time of trouble because you will have to live without a mediator. Now let me explain to you. The time of trouble will not begin until the judgment of the believers is over. And God will say, he that is just will remain what? Just by faith. So the issue is dealt with. Christ will vindicate the Christians in the judgment. If you don't believe me, look at Daniel 7, 22. He will win the case. He's our lawyer. We don't need a lawyer after the case is over. How many of you employ a lawyer for a case that is over and you have nothing, you know, he can do nothing for you. So please remember, we will still need a savior after probation closes. We will not be without the Holy Spirit. He will be controlling us. He will give us victory over the flesh. He will give us victory over unbelief. That is what, but we are waiting for the redemption of the body. That's why we are groaning. Now verse 24 of Romans 8. For we were saved in this hope. What hope? The redemption of our body. Hope that is seen if our body has already been redeemed. Why do we still hope for something we don't, we don't see? But verse 25. If we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. You know folks, our faith must endure unto the end. That is why your faith must be resting entirely on the love of God and the truth as it is in Christ. Now verse 27, now he who searches the hearts know what the mind of the spirit is. Folks, our performance may be failures many times, but our hearts must be right. Just like the man of Romans 7. He hates evil, he wants to do good, he chooses to do the right thing in his heart, but in practice he's failing, which is what we all go through. Now verse 28, and we know, I hope you know that, that all things, not some, all things work together for good. Not just the good things, but the bad things. To those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So when you're going through a crisis, you've lost your job or you're facing distress, please do not tell God, why are you mistreating me or why are you allowing this to happen? God never allows anything to happen without a purpose. Now the problem is he doesn't explain the purpose right now. He may explain it to you during the thousand years in heaven. And we were deported from Uganda. Jean said, God, why? We gave our lives to Africa. Now she says, I know why. But in those days, on the plane, she was not sure God was right. But now she knows that all things work together for good. Now verse 29 is very important. For whom he foreknew. Very important word. Foreknew means whom God knows beforehand. God knows beforehand any, every person that will accept his son. He also predestined. Please note, he did not predestine them for salvation. 
for whom he knew those who would accept Christ. He predestined not to be saved, he already saved, to be conformed to the image of his son, to reflect the character of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Christ is the firstborn. Christ revealed. Sometime in the future, I will present a study called The Two Dimensions of the Great Controversy. You know, folks, the great controversy is between Christ and Satan. Satan is the one who introduced the principle of self. You know, I like the way Sister White puts it in Steps to Christ, page 17. When Adam sinned, love disappeared and selfishness took its place. So we are born with a selfish nature. That is what the flesh is all about. In the life of Christ, there's two forces, the self principle, because Christ assumed our humanity, and the love, the love of God, which has no self in it, were in conflict. On the cross, folks, Satan did his very best to get Christ to come down and save himself. If Christ came down and saved himself, not only would the world be lost, but, but more than that, Satan would have won the battle in, in the great controversy. And it would be devastating for the whole universe. But folks, Christ refused to come down. He revealed that his agape love, which has no self in it, is greater than all the forces of self that Satan has mastered in our humanity. That, but while the battle was won at the cross, the war is not over. The war will not be over till the time of trouble. When the church, the body of Christ, will be tested the same way. And I hope you and I will be there to witness the power of the gospel. So what Paul is saying in verse 29, whom God knew who would accept his son, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he, Christ, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined to be conformed to Christ, these he also called. Whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. In other words, salvation from beginning to end is all of Christ. All of God. We make no contribution towards our salvation. But there is a problem, folks. As a church, we belong to the Armenian camp. You may not realize that, but Armenianism believes that man must contribute towards his salvation. Armenianism teaches that faith is man's gift to God and contributes to our salvation? The answer is no. Faith is accepting what God has already done for us in Christ 2,000 years ago. Faith does not contribute towards our salvation. We are never saved because of our faith. Nowhere in the Bible does it teach that. We are saved by faith or through faith. Faith is only an instrument or a channel by which we receive the righteousness of Christ. So please remember, Christian living is the evidence of the gospel. It is the demonstration of the power of the gospel that makes no contribution towards our salvation. And you better know that because in the time of trouble you will face a major problem. So verse 31 to 39 is a very important... Okay, let's go on. This suffering will, uh, will last until the second advent when we will be delivered from the flesh. Now. Let me explain to you. Paul is not talking of suffering by persecution. It, can be, it could be that. Folks, there are two natures that you and I have. The flesh and the spirit. These two natures are opposite. If we allow the spirit to fulfill its desires in us, then we are depriving the flesh what it wants. If we allow the flesh to control us, then we are depriving the spirit to control us. They're grieving the Holy Spirit. But you can't please both. You can't please the flesh and the spirit at the same time. One of the two has to suffer in our Christian walk. So I want to give you a text. Philippians 3, 20 and 21 tells us, saying exactly what Paul wrote in Romans 8, verse 22 onwards. But please turn to Philippians chapter 3. This is what we are waiting anxiously for. Philippians chapter 3, the last two verses. For our citizenship is in heaven. You see, all Christians have a dual citizenship. Our spiritual citizenship is in heaven. 
Our physical citizenship is in this world. What is more important? That's what will be tested in the time of trouble. For our citizenship in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies, our sinful bodies, that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working of which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Christ took to heaven a glorious body which he is reserving for you and for me. But because of the problem that we faced, that we will have to face a time of trouble without an intercessor, that we have to overcome every sin, yes, we have to do that to glorify Christ, but never to be saved. Let me put it this way. A new doctrine came up in the Indiana Conference many years ago when Ellen G. White was in Australia. That doctrine is called the Holy Flesh Movement. And this went this way. When your name comes up in the judgment, you pass the judgment, God will send the Holy Spirit and remove your sinful nature so that now you can live a holy life, you'll have a sinless nature, a holy flesh, until probation closes. Until Christ comes, rather. That was called the Holy Flesh Movement. Came in the Conference of Indiana. And the denomination, the leaders, brethren, sent Haskell to the camp meeting in Indiana to listen to what this is all about because the president was going to explain to his members what Holy Flesh is all about. Now remember, Alan G. Watt was in Australia. The president stands up behind the pulpit. Haskell is behind, sitting on the platform. And the deacon comes and gives him a letter from Alan G. White written three months before. And he reads the letter and he places the letter under the nose of the president. And this is what Alan G. White wrote. We will not have holy flesh until the second coming of Christ. This is a heresy. It is a lies of the devil that want to trap Christians. And words of that effect. And the president had to make a choice. Shall he accept what Alan G. White wrote or tell the people what this wonderful movement is? And you know what? He accepted the letter and confessed to his whole conference. But there was another movement, some of you older folks may know this movement, called the Awakening by Brimsmith, Robert Brimsmith from Australia. Taught exactly the same thing. He used modern psychology. He said, you know, the human mind has two parts, the conscious and the subconscious. The subconscious is the, is the seat of sin. When your name comes up, God will remove the subconscious so that you will have a holy mind, a holy flesh, that you can live without a mediator. And folks, people began to accept that. I was in a mission field. I was in Uganda when this happened. And we had an African pastor from South Africa who belonged to that movement. He was paid by Robert Brimsmith. And he came to the president and he said, I'm a pastor from South Africa. Can I visit your churches? And the president gave him full permission. And he began to introduce him to the officers of the conference. And I was the minister's secretary. And, you know, I said, what are you doing here in Uganda? Oh, I'm here on vacation. Now, I know Africans too well. Why would an African from South Africa, the most developed part of Africa, come to Uganda for vacation? So I knew something was fishy. So I said to him, "Uh, do you you belong to the awakening, Robert Brimley? And he said, what's wrong with that? I said, I didn't ask that question. And then he said to me, the church has mistreated me. They have removed my credential. And I said, you never told that to the president. Why should I? He said, he's given me permission. I said, no. So I went back to the president and I said, please, take away that permission, which he did. And he said, you can't stop me. I said, fine. So the president wanted to write letters to all the churches rejecting. I said, no, no, that's not the solution. When you say to some, don't do this, they will do it. Am I correct? You tell your kids, don't do this, and guess what they do? So I said, let me visit all the churches when they are there. So this man from South Africa, his name was Swani, came up to the church, 
at least. And I went to every church that he went to. And before he spoke, I said, I would like to tell you what this man is preaching. And I think it might be good news. I explained to him the Holy Flesh movement that Robert Brins was teaching. They even clapped their hands. This is what we have been waiting for. And I said, can you see how easy it is for me to deceive? You are pastors, and I can deceive you. And I showed them the heresy behind that teaching. And thank God, they all rejected this man. So the Holy Flesh movement did not take place in Uganda. But folks, you will have sinful natures until you die or until Christ comes. Until then, your hope is in the power of the Holy Spirit. He is able to give you victory. But not to save you. He's not a co-redeemer. But to glorify Jesus Christ. Now let's look in closing verse 31 to 30. Very important because Paul has been expounding the gospel from chapter 321 right up to chapter 8 verse 20, 30. But verse 31 to 39 is the conclusion. Very important. What then shall we say to these things? What shall we say about this good news of the gospel? If God is for us, who can be what? Now, I don't like the word if. The better translation is, since God is for us, who can be against us? Now, we know the devil is against us. He accuses us day and night. Revelation 12, 10. How do you know God is, against, is for us? He who did not spare his own son. Three times in Gethsemane, Jesus pleaded with the Father, remove the cup. And the cup is not crucifixion. It's the wrath of God against sin. But delivered him up for us all. God did not answer that prayer. How shall he, God, with Christ, also freely, graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect, against God's believers? It is God who justifies. You know, when I first became an Adventist, I thought that Jesus was on my side, but I was not sure about the Father. And I thought Jesus was standing by the Father, pleading for me. Please don't be so hard on him. No, folks. All three members of the Godhead are on our side. The Father doesn't charge you against any accusation. Why? Because it is God, verse 33, who just declares us righteous. Verse 34, who is it that condemns? It is not Christ. Christ will never condemn us. Why? Who died? He died to remove that condemnation. And furthermore, he is also reason who is even at the right hand of God, not enjoying sustentation, but who is making intercession for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? I like the question. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? These are the things that make us feel that God has rejected us. But his answer is, and he's quoting from the Old Testament, for your sake we are killed all the day long. Remember, the Christian church was under persecution during his time. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Look at verse 37 to 30. Yet in all these things, the, all these things refers to tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, and so on. In all these things, we are not only conquerors, but we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, that the devil is in, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, financial crisis or terrorism, no height, no depth, no any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which was revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Folks, Paul concludes Romans with these incredible encouraging words. The incredible good news of the gospel, folks, is that God is on our side. We may fail him, we may, we may, we may discourage, I mean, we may, you know, uh, miss many th things wrong, and that nothing, but nothing can se ever separate us from his love. So my prayer, folks, is that his, this knowledge that God is on our side and his love will never forsake us is what gives us an unshakable faith no matter what we have to face in the future. May this be our experience, is my prayer for all of you. Let us pray. Loving Father, what you have shared with us is incredible good news. We thank you. There will never come a time when you will stop loving us. We may fail you. We may 
misrepresent you sometimes. Lord, we may feel that you are no longer by our side, but we know by faith that you will never, never forsake us. And may that be the anchor of our soul, because the future doesn't look very bright. It doesn't matter who is the president of this country. The issue is more than that. We are facing, like Europe is facing, major crises. The world is facing major issues. But we know that we have a hope that this world cannot give us. But in Jesus Christ, we have a blessed hope which we eagerly wait for. May our faith endure unto the end is our prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Go home in peace. Now, our next study, December 10, is a long one. Three chapters, 9, 10, and 11. Paul turns his attention to the Jews. Very important truth for us. So please read all three chapters by December 10, 9, 10, and 11. May God bless you.